Hi, hello everyone and welcome to the Spring Masterclass organized by Doxity in partnership with Peking University School of Transnational Law. I'm Alessandra, nice to meet you all, and I will be your host for today's event on behalf of Doxity. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us uh, to those who are already connected. We will wait a few minutes before officially starting with the presentation to allow everyone to connect. But in the meantime, feel free to say hi on our chat here on Zoom and tell us where you're from because we are curious to know. So first, I want to thank everyone for joining us and uh, especially our panelists for being uh, here with us today. Here we have Paul uh, Agar, Director of Graduate and International Programs and Professor Norman Ho, a Professor of Law at Peking University. So together with them, uh, we are going to explore today's topic. First, together with Paul, we're going to have a brief introduction about Peking University. And then together with Professor Ho, uh, we're going to explore today's topic, which will be Confucian, uh, Confucian legal hypotheticals and the doctrine of mutual concealment in traditional Chinese law. So at the end of the masterclass, you will also have the opportunity to interact with our speakers and ask them questions. So talking about that, I would like to remind you that after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you will be able to ask direct question to our panelists. And to do so, just type all of your questions in the Q&A box here on Zoom, and we will go through the questions at the end of the presentation. Another important information for those of you interested in receiving a certificate of attendance by Doxity for the masterclass, stay tuned because we will be posting the link to get the certificate at the end of the uh, session on the Zoom chat. So in the meantime, I see here that we already have some new people that have just joined us. Welcome to those who just joined. And I think that we are able to start now. So without Further ado, I'm now leaving the floor to Cole and Professor Ho for their presentation, and we will see each other at the end of the webinar. So enjoy. Bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alessandra, and welcome everyone um, to today's uh, webinar. Um, as Alessandra mentioned, my name is Cole Agar. I am a director at our School of Transnational Law. And before I turn over the, the microphone um, to Professor Ho, I just wanted to give everyone maybe a, a brief background to our school and, and to where Professor Ho and I come from. So if you're not already familiar uh, with Peking University, you should be. We are the oldest university in China. And today we are one of the top ranked universities in the entire world. Our School of Transnational Law is a particularly maybe interesting and unique sort of experimental law school started within Peking University. We were the only law school in China to be founded with English as a primary language of instruction and a curriculum that explicitly combines Western law, Chinese law, and throws in a lot of courses in areas like international law, intellectual property and beyond. Um, we're also a program and, and, and a law school that really prides ourselves in being multi-jurisdictional and combining intellectual and practical. So you will find courses, you know, for example, taught by Norman, by Professor Ho, in areas like traditional Chinese legal thought. But you might also find him teaching a class like international capital market transactions with Hong Kong. And, and in many ways, I'd say Professor Ho really embodies the best of STL. With a background at institutions like NYU and Harvard, he has both practical experience and, and really interesting academic and intellectual pursuits. So Professor Ho has taught at top international law firms in Hong Kong, in areas like capital markets and uh, uh, international mergers and acquisitions. But in his academic pursuits, he, he goes into things that range from American property law, kind of one of the core JD topics that you would take if you went somewhere like the United States, to interests ranging as far as Chinese legal history. And you're gonna get a taste of that in, in just a moment. Um, 
So I think I'll leave it at that. It's it's an exciting uh, school for any of you who are interested. You could ask some of those questions at the end. And I personally am very excited to hear Professor Ho's talk. So I will stop talking myself and I will turn over the floor to him. Thank you, Professor Ho, for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cole, and also Alessandra and Doc City for the invitation. And again, thank you all for coming. And uh, as Cole mentioned, I teach at Peking University School of Transnational Law, and Cole is a, a colleague and friend, and we work together uh, at the school. And uh, as Cole also mentioned, as an academic, my two major research areas are Chinese legal history, legal thought, uh, and also property law. And so today uh, you'll get the Chinese legal history, Chinese legal thought uh, part of me, I suppose you could think of it that way. So uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation. And so I'll just share that here. And then I will use the duh, 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 the presentation mode here slideshow okay uh, this is visible i assume so uh my presentation uh, today is entitled legal hypotheticals and the doctrine of mutual or sometimes called kinship concealment in confucian legal thought uh, and before i jump into the topic i will just say a brief word about uh, what it is uh, generally that you will get today big picture so I want to take you through uh, the process of how a Confucian a traditional norm, a moral norm, is codified into traditional Chinese law. And so I want to take you on a journey, really, of how a Confucian moral value gets translated into Chinese traditional law. And there are many values we could focus on, but today uh, the value I want to focus on is this idea of mutual or sometimes called kinship concealment. And from this one value, from this one norm and its process of translation and integration into legal statutes, perhaps we can also learn something more generally and more broadly about Chinese legal culture. Okay. So just before... Uh, we get into the specifics, let me just explain a couple of terms uh, before we get into this. Legal hypotheticals, uh, of course, refers to fact patterns, fictional fact patterns. And for those of you who are law students or who have studied law, you may have had experience working uh, with hypotheticals. Oftentimes, professors will create fictional fact patterns, fictional stories, fictional hypotheticals for you to analyze and ask you to solve the legal problem contained in those hypotheticals. So that's what I mean by legal hypotheticals. Uh, the doctrine of mutual or sometimes called kinship concealment, I will go over in greater detail, but just to quickly define that term, uh, the phrase mutual or kinship concealment, that generally refers to family members, so kin, kinship, family members covering each other's crimes, covering up for each other. And then Confucian legal thought, this phrase, by Confucian, uh, I'm looking first uh, at early Confucianism. Confucianism is a very rich and broad tradition, and so there are many thinkers in the Confucian tradition. But as you will see in today's presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on Confucius, Kongzi in Chinese, and Mencius, Mengzi. Probably the first two and most important two Confucians in the Chinese tradition. And when I refer to legal thought, I mean legal thought in a broad sense, what philosophers think or thought about law, legal punishments, and law's relationship with other non-law norms, such as moral norms. So let's start with a legal hypothetical. Now, remember I had mentioned legal hypotheticals are things like what your law professor might give you. He might give you a fictitious story, 
and ask you to solve the legal problem. Now, some people don't know that actually Confucians, Confucian philosophers, also posed legal hypotheticals. They posed legal hypotheticals and also gave answers about how to solve legal problems for fictional situations. And today I want to analyze one Confucian legal hypothetical uh, that is presented by the Confucian philosopher Mengzi, uh, or in English, Mencius. And as you can see on this slide, I have provided the legal hypothetical in full, the full passage. So let's take a look at it together. Tao Ying asked, Tao Ying is a disciple of Mencius's. Tao Ying asked, when Xun was son of heaven and Gao Yao was his minister of crime, if the blind man had murdered someone, what would they have done? Okay, now... For those of you who are not familiar with Chinese history, you see that there are numerous names here uh, that you may not recognize, and that is okay because we will go through those right now. So I had also men I already mentioned that Tao Ying is a disciple of Mencius, Mencius being a famous Confucian philosopher. Now you see some other people here. You see three characters: Shun, Gao Yao, and the blind man. So Shun is uh, essentially an ancient Chinese sage king, an ancient Chinese sage emperor who has been revered throughout all of Chinese history, and especially by Confucians as being an upright, a moral, a dedicated ruler who did good things for Chinese civilization, who was not only an effective leader, but a good person. In the middle, you see Gao Yao, Gao Yao was Xun's minister of justice. His job was in part administering and enforcing the laws of the kingdom. Then on the right, you see the blind old man. And you can recognize the blind old man is wearing the blue clothing. And you can see his eyes in this painting are white. Uh, basically symbolizing his blindness. He is sometimes also referred to in Chinese texts as Gu So, and I have the pinging there. Now, who is the blind old man? He is not some random person. Okay, He is Xun's father, and this is going to be very important to remember. He's Xun's father. Uh, we are told that uh, Xun's father was blind, and when Xun was very young, he was very dedicated to his father, took care of his father. Uh, now, his father uh, uh, married another woman later on in his life, who was therefore Shrin's stepmother. And we are told that Shrin's stepmother was extremely cruel toward Shrin. But Shrin remained dedicated to his father. He loved his father, despite the difficult relationship he had with his vindictive a stepmother. Okay. So <clears throat> these are the three characters. Okay. I'm going to go back to the passage now. So now that you know who the characters are, we can continue with this passage. Tao Ying asked, when Shun was son of heaven, son of heaven is just another term for emperor. When Shun was son of heaven and Gao Yao was his minister of crime or minister of justice, if the blind man, Shun's father, had murdered someone, what would they have done? So this is the legal hypothetical that Tao Ying poses to his teacher, Mencius. And Mencius answers, Gao Yao would simply have arrested him, him being the blind man. Tao Ying is very surprised that Mencius would say something like this. And he asked, so Shun would not have forbidden it? After all, the blind old man is Shun's father. And Tao Ying is very surprised that Mencius would say something like this, that Gao Yao, the minister of justice, would just arrest Shun's father. Mencius says, how could Shun have forbidden it? Gao Yao had a sanction for his actions. Sanction here uh, in English means approval. Okay? Sanction can also mean punishment, right? Uh, but here uh, in this context, it means approval. Gao Yao had an approval for his actions. Tao Ying asked, so what 
which shouldn't have done. And this is the really key part, the heart of Mencius' answer. Mencius said, Shun looked at casting aside the whole world like casting aside a worn sandal. He would have secretly carried him, the blind man, on his back and fled to live in the coastland, happy to the end of his days, joyfully forgetting the world. Okay. It's a short legal hypothetical. Mencius answers this question that Tallinn asks him. It's short, but actually we can learn a lot about Confucian philosophy and its views about especially the relationship between parents and children and how that might affect the administration of law. So let me just return to this passage. I sort of uh, jumped the gun, so to speak. I don't want to get to the next slide yet. But if you just look at this passage uh, on a very simple level, what's happened here? Well, Mencia says that the Emperor Xun would have allowed his minister of justice to arrest his father. He would not have interfered with the arrest. However, at the end of the day, what does Shun do. Mencius essentially says, in response to this hypo, hypothetical, that Shun would still have done what? Shun would have carried his father and escaped legal punishment. He would have helped his father escape. In other words, he would have helped his father cover up his crime by helping his father escape from the judicial net, from prosecution, and to flee to the coast living together with his father. But I want you guys to note something. Shrin also sacrifices something. Does everybody see? Shrin does not simply just help his father break out of jail and remain as emperor. He does not do that. Mencius makes very clear, and Mencius is making a point here, Shrin would and Shrin should do what? cast aside his kingdom, cast aside the whole world, the whole world here referring to his kingdom, and he shouldn't hesitate to do this. It should just be as easy as if you have a sandal that's really old and that's falling apart. You would throw that sandal away, that old shoe away, and buy a new shoe, and you wouldn't think anything of it. Manchester's point here is Shun would and should also not hesitate to give up his position, give up his kingdom, give up his title as emperor, and help his father escape and forget about the world and just live happily ever after. So I think it's important to note that even though at the end of the day, in this hypothetical and his answer to this legal hypothetical, even though Mencius, the Confucian philosopher, does advocate for Xun to help his father get out of jail and escape, Mencius does make very clear that this does involve a sacrifice, that Xun must give up his position also as emperor. In other words, Xun has two identities. If you guys think about it as emperor, Xun has two identities. He's an emperor, but he is also a son. And what is Mencius saying? You can't in this hypothetical, you can't have it both ways. You can't help your father escape. In other words, you can't embrace your identity as a son, help your father escape, and remain as emperor. You've got to give the emperor part up. And I think that's quite significant. So we can hear, see here in this passage Confucian philosophical and moral norms about children, in this case a son, helping cover up crimes committed by their fathers. Now, where does this Confucian moral norm come from? Mencius certainly didn't create this. This comes from Confucius himself. On this slide, I have a passage for you from the Analects of Confucius. Analects means sayings, the sayings of Confucius. And this is a passage uh, which records a conversation between Confucius and the political leader. And let's take a look at this. The Duke of Shu, this is just a political leader in ancient China, said to Confucius, Among my people, there is one we call Upright Gong. 
you know, upright, morally good Gong, Mr. Gong, who is morally upright. When his father stole a sheep, he reported him to the authorities. So the Duke of Shu is basically saying, look at my kingdom. Everybody's so law-abiding that they put the law above their own personal family interests. There's this guy in my kingdom, he says, called Upright Gong. When his father, even when his father stole a sheep, he reported his father to the authorities. Confucius replies, uh, Confucius' reply is the opposite, essentially, of what this duke has said. And Confucius replies, among my people, those who we consider upright are different from this. Fathers cover up for their sons, and sons cover up for their fathers. And it, uprightness is to be found in this. So what's the point here? Confucius is presenting us with this moral norm, advocating concealment. But note, Confucius talks about concealment between what kinfolk, what kinspeople, father and son, sons covering up for their fathers, fathers covering up for their sons. And he's sort of, in a way, he's sort of uh, making fun of the Duke because he's saying, oh, I don't know what's wrong with your people. Your people must be messed up. Your people must be messed up. They, they report their fathers. No, my people, we don't act like that. Our fathers cover up for their sons. Our sons cover up for their fathers. Okay. So this slide here uh, just sort of recaps, summarizes what I said about uh, the Mencius passage. And you can see this slide is called, What Can We Say About This Passage? By this passage, I'm referring to the conversation between Mencius and Tao Ying, uh, the longer passage we had looked at earlier. And the Mencius legal hypothetical, this idea of what should Emperor Xun do if his father is arrested for murder, presents a dilemma uh, for Emperor Xun because there is a conflict among norms. The Emperor Xun had a conflict between his obligations under the law, fa in Chinese, plus law enforcement, versus his personal obligations to his father. Uh, the Chinese notion, the Confucian notion of xiao or filial piety, the idea that one should be dedicated and devoted to one's parents. And I think, and I hope you could see that Mencius, he is very smart in the sense that, again, he doesn't just say the Emperor Xun would help his father escape and he would stay as emperor. No. Mencius tried to provide an answer, which I think tried to balance the above conflict. So as you can see on this slide, and as we have discussed, Shrin not only covers up for his father, according to Mencius, he says Shrin would cover up and Shrin should cover up for his father, but Shrin would help his father escape from the jurisdiction and from the nets of the law and legal punishment. But at the same time, Mencius says Shrin would do this and he should do this. So he's making sort of a descriptive point and a normative point. He would and should do this after his father is arrested. Shun would not interfere with the fully legal authorized actions of his minister of crime, Gao Yao. And furthermore, Shun would accept a self-imposed sacrifice or punishment in a way. He would relinquish or give up his position as emperor, as a public figure, as a leader, and instead embrace his identity as a normal person and as a son. So I think we can see from this that Mencius seems to be suggesting that leaders who do not follow the law in order to cover for their fathers are acting morally in accordance with the Confucian norm of obedience and protection of your parents, but they nevertheless cannot continue to be leaders, political leaders, due to their ignoring the law. But at the end of the day, Mencius' response to the legal hypothetical posed by his student is clear. The final message is quite clear. Emperor Xun's duties to his father would and should outweigh his duties to the law. So we have talked about the Confucian norm of kinship concealment or mutual concealment. And just to recap what we have looked at, we have looked at primarily fathers and sons.
Uh, Mencius's hypothetical involves what? A son covering up for his father, a son helping his father escape. Confucius talked about what? Sons and fathers covering up for each other. Now that we've discussed the moral norm, remember I told you at the start of today's webinar that I want to take you through also Chinese legal history. I want you to see how this Confucian moral norm got translated, got integrated into Chinese traditional law. So that'll be the next part of my presentation. These Confucian norms about kinship concealment influence later dynasties in Chinese history and dynastic legal codes. And Chinese dynastic laws throughout the dynasties, as you'll see, I'll give you some examples, eventually permitted in the statutes certain family members to cover up crimes committed by other family members. So, for example, sons covering up for their fathers. Family members could refuse to testify and or they could help certain family members escape the law. And uh, there was a process, I will argue, I'll try to show you, of expansion. In other words, early statutes permitted unilateral concealment. By unilateral concealment, we mean one way, sons covering up for their fathers. But in later dynasties, the authorities expanded uh, the concealment right in the law from unilateral to mutual. So not just son covering up for father, but son covering up for father and father covering up for the son. So let's take a look at some specific examples from Chinese history. This is from the Han Dynasty, uh, from Emperor Xin who uh, his dates are 74 to 48 BC. And Emperor Shin, when he came to the throne shortly after, he issued an edict. He did issue an edict, which basically permitted kinship concealment. Now, I've translated the relevant part of the edict so you can see what it looks like in full, not just a summary. So let me read it out loud for you. Quote, the closeness of father and son and the doll, the way of the husband and wife, are all in accordance with what is natural from heaven. Even if one should encounter disasters and catastrophes, one must risk one's life to think of ways to protect the lives of his or her family members. In the family, in every nook and cranny, there are the ties of mutual love and affection, where benevolence and love and kindness reach to high points. How could we possibly go against these principles? From today forth, there will be no punishment for a son who covers up his father's offenses, for a wife who covers up her husband's offenses, and grandchildren who cover up their grandparents' offenses. End quote. Now, take a look at Emperor Shin's edict, which is law. The emperor's edicts are considered law in traditional China. Can you guys see? The concealment right has been expanded from the Confucian norms that were stated by Confucius and Mencius. How were they expanded? So you guys remember Confucius talked about mutual concealment, but only son, father, father, and son. And what do you guys notice about Emperor Shrin in the Han? He basically says it's not just going to be father and son. The cast of characters, the people who are protected, are expanded. So it's father, it's what? Son, father, wife, husband, grandchildren, grandparent. Okay, so the people that are permitted to help each other cover up their crimes has been expanded from father to son to more groups. Uh, so in this sense, the concealment right is now broader than what Confucius and Mencius said. Uh, in one sense, it's a little bit more narrow because if you read this passage carefully, Emperor Shrin isn't very clear. He is not very clear whether the right is mutual. So do you guys see? He says son can cover up for father, wife covers up for husband. But it's not clear from this passage whether husband can cover up for wife, father can cover up for their son. So in that sense, there is a bit of ambiguity of whether these rights are mutual or not or whether unilateral. But there's no doubt that there has been an expansion of this right in terms of the number of people, relatives, who can enjoy this right. 
It's not just fa father and son anymore. The other example I want to give you is that this concealment right privilege is expanded even more uh, in the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is very important in Chinese legal history because it is considered by many historians as the dynasty where traditional Chinese law reaches its full development. And the Tang Code, which is the penal code, the criminal law of the Tang Dynasty, is considered by many historians to be a very significant achievement in traditional Chinese law. And we know that the Tang Code, the Tang criminal code of the Tang Dynasty, not only influenced future Chinese dynasties, later Chinese dynasties, a large percentage of their criminal code, such as the Ming Dynasty Code or the Qing Dynasty Code, the vast majority of articles are basically from the Tang Code. So not only were later dynasty laws uh, impacted, we also know for a fact that other Asian kingdoms also use the Tang Code as a reference for their legal development. There is evidence to suggest, for example, that ancient Vietnam, pre-modern Vietnam, was influenced by the Tang Code. There is also evidence that uh, pre-modern Japan and pre-modern Korea, to some extent, were also influenced by the Tang Code. And the Tang Code has a provision for mutual concealment. I didn't put the entire provision up on the slide because that would be too much text. So I just gave you the key passage here from Article 46.1a. Let's read it together. Quote, all cases involving those who dwell together or relatives of third or closer degree of mourning, including maternal grandparents, grandsons in the female line, the wives of grandchildren in the male line, and the husband's brothers and their wives allow mutual concealment should one of them commit a crime. Uh, and then in brackets, there are some exceptions where you cannot use mutual concealment privilege. Uh, so if your relative plots rebellion or plots sedition or plots tradition, you can't conceal that. You have to report that to the authorities. But all other crimes, essentially, uh, mutual concealment privileges apply. The Tang Code also explains what it means by mutual concealment. Mutual concealment does not simply mean just helping somebody cover up their crime. Uh, it means other things, too. Helping somebody cover up their crime, yes, but also uh, the state could not force you to testify. Uh, you didn't have to accuse your relatives. You could help your relative escape. That's what Shrin did in that hypothetical. Uh, you can help hide your relative, and the government cannot extort testimony from you. And the Tong Code expanded this right considerably. You guys can see from just Article 46.1a, it's not just your father and son anymore. It's also what? It's also husband and wives. Also relatives of the third or closer degree of mourning. Now, what does that mean, third or closer degree of mourning? Let me just explain that really quickly. Can you guys see this slide? This is a mourning relationship chart from the Qing dynasty. And just to simplify this, uh, in traditional China, your relatives were classified based on degree of mourning. Now, what does that mean? Mourning, of course, means what? When somebody dies, you mourn for them. You uh, honor them. You think of them. You may have funerals or ceremonies for them. And in pre-modern China, there was a system of degrees of mourning. One, two, three, four. Uh, now, your closest relatives were considered degree of mourning one. That impacted your life because if a relative in your degree one circle died, there were basically more obligations on you. In other words, the, you had to take the funeral very seriously. Uh, you had to do more mourning, basically, for that relative. And you guys can see on this chart, uh, if you are at the bottom here, ego, that's you, father, look at the degree of mourning, one. Okay, And you guys see grandfather, degree of mourning, two. 
Your uncle would be degree of mourning two. Your brother, if you have a brother, degree of mourning two. And you guys, can you guys see uncle's children, degree of mourning three? So uncle's children would be your what? That would be your cousin. That's right, cousin. Okay. So let's get back to the tongue code. Article 46.1a says what? All cases involving those who dwell together or relatives of the third or closer degree. So mutual concealment is not just about father and son. It's not just about husband and wife. It's not even about just grandson and grandparents. It also now includes your uncle. It includes your uncle's children, your cousins. So in other words, under the Tong Code, if we apply this article, you could technically cover up for your cousin's crimes. And your cousins could cover up for you. And the Tong Code makes very clear that the concealment privilege is not just one way. It's not just son-father, but son-father, father, and son. It's mutual. So this is the takeaway I want to leave with you guys at the bottom of this slide. In other words, dynastic law, I would argue, went above and beyond what Confucius and Mencius said. Uh, so I'm a legal historian. I, I do legal history, uh, Chinese legal history. So I always joke with people that as a person who does legal history, I'm not that interested in the present <laughs> uh, and less so even for the future. When people ask questions like, oh, what do you think uh, about this law in the future? I always joke that, well, I do legal history. I don't know much about the present. I don't know much about the <laughs> future, uh, or even less so about the future. Uh, but uh, I wanted to end my presentation with just two more slides talking about perhaps the modern impact of uh, these Confucian attitudes about kinship concealment and also about the dynastic legal provisions of kinship concealment. Uh, and indeed, if uh, some of you decide to come to Peking University School of Transnational Law to study, uh, you will be able to also take modern Chinese law, contemporary Chinese law courses uh, that are taught in English. Uh, so we have that too at STL. Uh, STL is short for School of Transnational Law, Peking University School of Transnational Law. So this slide, I, I, I just posed the question, do attitudes of mutual concealment persevere? There is evidence to suggest that such attitudes do. This is an article from the South China Morning Post, which is an English language newspaper based out of Hong Kong SAR uh, in China. And you can see uh, the headline. Chinese family asked for mercy after covering up killing by son for 16 years. And essentially, uh, the story is quite a tragic story. Uh, a man stabbed his cousin to death after he caught his cousin beating his father. Uh, and then um, his family covered up the killing for 16 years. And eventually, uh, the fugitive, uh, the man who stabbed his cousin, uh, he his family helped him escape, presumably. He uh, went on to have his own family, but eventually uh, got caught. He, he, well, he turned himself in, and his family members asked for leniency. And so uh, I don't actually know what happened to him. I don't know what the disposition of this case was. Uh, I couldn't find a, a report later in the South China Morning Post. But the point is that the attitudes, perhaps, of mutual concealment and the accept acceptability of uh, mutual concealment from at least a moral point of view may continue to persevere. Does what we have discussed, the Confucian moral norms and thoughts of mutual concealment that were expressed by Confucius and Ventris, but also the dynastic legal provisions on concealment, do they have any influence on modern law? Again, uh, I don't – again, like I have joked before, I don't know much about the present. Uh, we have experts – at STL, the School of Transnational Law, who focus on modern Chinese law. But perhaps one could argue that we can see vestiges or traces of the Confucian influence on certain provisions in modern Chinese law. So if you look at Article 193 of the People's Republic of China Criminal Procedure Law, 
what does it say? It says in part, quote, where a witness without good reasons fails to appear before a people's court to give testimony upon receipt of the notice of the people's court, the people's court may compel the witness to appear unless the witness is the spouse, parent, or child of the defendant, end quote. So Article 193, you guys can see, part of it provides for what? It provides for parent-child privilege in a way, as well as spousal privilege. Now, this is quite unique uh, in the sense that the parent-child privilege, if we want to call it that, that maybe is influenced by some Chinese legal history. Okay? And if you look at – if you contrast this with some Western jurisdictions, and I'm just going to choose uh, U.S. law, uh, of course – America is not the only Western jurisdiction. I just choose it out of convenience here. Uh, American law provides for spousal privilege in evidence law. Husbands and wives or spouses under certain situations cannot be compelled to testify against each other. Uh, however, in American law, there is no currently parent-child privilege. Uh, in other words, you can't take a privilege. You can't say, I can't be compelled to testify against my uh, own father. Now, interestingly, there are some U.S. politicians who have tried to introduce legislation to amend the U.S. federal rules of evidence to provide for parent-child privilege. For example, in 2003, a congressman in the in the United States introduced a bill called the Parent-Child Privilege Act of 2003. Now, uh, I don't think the bill went anywhere. It wasn't passed. Uh, but the fact that there are politicians who have tried to introduce this uh, is quite an interesting comparative viewpoint for this idea of kinship concealment. Or if we use modern terminology, maybe we might call it parent-child privilege. Okay? Uh, and the last point I'll just leave with leave you with is I have referred to this norm, uh, kinship concealment, as a Confucian norm, simply because we're talking about Chinese legal history, and we're looking at how this norm developed in Chinese legal history. But just, I think one point needs to be made is that the Confucian norm of kinship concealment may not really be uniquely uh, Chinese or Confucian. What do I mean by that? It fundamentally, perhaps, one could argue, is a human, is a human norm. It doesn't matter if you're Chinese, American, British, Russian, French, or wherever you're from, one can argue that there is always discomfort uh, of the notion of parents giving up their children or children giving up their parents. I don't know if any of you have seen a movie. I sometimes, when I teach, I like to use movie references. But as I get older and um, I realize sometimes the movies that I've watched, my students have not seen because they're, of course, part of a much younger generation. So this movie reference may fail uh, miserably, but hopefully maybe some of you have seen this movie. Have any of you seen the movie Catch Me If You Can is the English name. It's a movie. Uh, the actors are Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, you know, the famous actor in Titanic, and Tom Hanks, the famous actor in Forrest Gump. Tom Hanks' character plays a FBI agent. Leonardo DiCaprio's character is a uh, – well, he's essentially a criminal who forges checks. Tom Hanks is the FBI agent. Tom's Hanks, Tom Hanks' character is trying to catch Leonardo DiCaprio's character. And in one scene, uh, Tom Hanks' character finds Leonardo DiCaprio's father, who is played by the actor, actor Christopher Walken. And in this scene, Tom Hanks' character goes to talk to the father, and he says, do you know your son? Your, your son is a criminal, you know, and, and uh, it would be better for your son if you told us where he was. And in this scene, C Christopher Walken, who plays Leonardo DiCaprio's father, you know, he walks up to Tom Hanks' character and he says, I would never give up my son. Never. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he says uh, – if you were a parent, you would understand that. Okay. Now, in the movie, actually, Tom Hanks' character does have uh, a kid. Okay. But anyway, that that's the scene. So that that notion, yeah, uh, covering up for your son, sons covering up for fathers, it's a human 
um, arguably it's a human kind of uh, belief, universal perhaps. Okay, uh, but we've looked at it in the Confucian context today. Thank you for your attention and interest. And uh, I know that uh, Cole and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Perfect. Thank you so much to both Cole and Professor Ho for their thorough and really interesting presentation, I would say. So I see here that we already have some questions. So I think that we are able to start now with the first one, shall we? So. The first one is uh, by Antonio, and he asks, how much did this um, influence the new Chinese uh, civil code, which came into force on January 1st, 2021, uh, if it had an impact? So I don't know if kinship uh, consumment or the norms about kinship consumment had any direct impact on the civil code, in part because uh, these the issue of kinship concealment in Chinese history, again, is about covering up for your family members' crimes. So it doesn't implicate civil law. This would be in criminal law. And so in criminal law, we have uh, that article I had in the presentation about, um, you know, one might call it parent-child privilege, for lack of a better term. For the civil code, I don't, I'm not aware of any direct uh uh influences of kinship concealment but i mean i would just say the indirectly obviously if you look at kinship concealment from a broader level kinship concealment ultimately is about what the moral goodness the moral correctness of children honoring their parents uh, and being respectful and dutiful to their parents and obviously that general moral norm, arguably we see evidence of that in Chinese civil law. Uh, there are legislation in China, for example, about relationship between parents and children, uh, children ha uh, uh, um, taking care of their parents and um, so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. So we have another one by Mark, and he says, hello, in the context of Confucianization of law, how do Chinese legal scholars view the balance between preserving cultur cultural heritage sorry, and adapting legal system to address contemporary societal challenges? Yeah, so this is a, a very good question and very large question. So the Chinese legal tradition is important, uh, and there are many Chinese legal scholars studying Chinese legal history, and the Chinese government and leaders in the Chinese government have also given speeches and written essays about the importance of learning from Chinese legal tradition in helping China reform its laws today. Although generally, uh, when these speeches and essays are given, they're at a more general level. There's not many specific examples given of how to, well, to use the phrase in Mark's questions, how we preserve cultural heritage specifically in the law. Um, my, my own sense is that, um, okay, so, uh, one can make a variety of arguments. Uh, one can say that there are aspects of where cultural heritage, to use Marx's term, or legal heritage, Chinese legal history, is directly influencing uh, modern Chinese law. Okay. Uh, another possible answer would be, well, no, we don't really see much influence. In fact, there's, in other words, there's not a balance. Um, Preserving cultural heritage is important, uh, but not so much in the law sphere, meaning we will talk about preserving cultural heritage as a general matter. It's desirable from a policy point of view. We'll build museums. We will teach people in schools proper Confucian behavior and norms. You know, when kids go to high school, when kids go to middle school, we teach them, oh, you got to respect your teachers. You got to stand up when your teachers walk in. But then, uh, Legal systems? No. Legal systems, contemporary social challenges, we don't really uh, connect cultural heritage with that. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I, I actually, based on my crude observation, uh, I, I tend to see the situation here more in the latter, meaning preserving cultural heritage is important, but I don't see much evidence of how that is directly in um, the legal system, say for uh, there are certain laws, like I mentioned about uh, parents and children relationships and so forth. Um, so you see more cultural heritage protection uh, impacting social norms and social behaviors, not so much uh, legal norms per se. Yeah. So definitely Chinese uh, again, I'm generalizing, but many, many uh, people in China, they're in terms of their daily life and how they interact with people, um, they uh, uh, many people keep in mind, of course, cultural norms from history, uh, Confucian ideas. But in terms of legal system, the legal sphere of life, uh, there isn't that much of that. I, I will give Mark uh, just one example, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll stop um, for this question. Uh, maybe there's one example where you can see a balance trying to be uh, sought between cultural heritage and adapting legal systems to contemporary societal challenges. Let's take one contemporary social challenge. Uh, uh, as China's economy has developed rapidly, there are just naturally more and more civil disputes people more people sue each other because people may renege on contracts there may be economic disputes and that's a social challenge how do we deal with that well of course we uh, need to refine the civil law uh, we need to refine the judiciary uh, but uh, in pre-modern chinese culture especially Confucian, Confucian culture, there is an anti-litigation belief. In other words, uh, traditional Confucianism didn't like the idea of civil litigation. Uh, they didn't think it should be banned necessarily, but they didn't like it because they thought litigation, civil litigation was wasteful. It destroyed human relationships because uh, this is not unique to China. I mean, if you sue somebody in America or Britain, I don't think you'll be friends with that person afterwards. And so there's a Confucian preference for mediation and talking with people. Uh, and so I think this is a specific example where the state – in China has tried to strike a balance between, well, we want to, of course, make sure that if people need to do civil litigation, uh, we're going to have better trained judges, we're going to have the apparatus there. But at the same time, we want to balance that with, well, as Marx said, preserving cultural heritage, or if you want to say preserving the Confucian or traditional idea that civil litigation is to be avoided. And so just to give you a, a, a very specific example, now uh, in Sinzin, for example, where our school is located, uh, neighbor disputes are very common, especially during the pandemic. People were working from home. There was a lot of noise problems, uh, which got a lot of people on edge. This is, of course, not uniquely a Chinese problem. I think anybody who lives in an apartment can commiserate with this problem. Uh, but uh, neighborhoods now, residential neighborhoods now have basically like committees uh, and volunteers who try to handle neighborhood disputes there before even getting to the court. Yeah. And you know, I don't want to overemphasize. I, I'm not saying that, oh, those neighborhood disputes are Confucian, that those neighborhood committees are directly influenced by Confucianism. I'm not saying that. And I think people who say that may be going too far. But I guess the general idea, the general anti-litigation culture uh, may have a role there to play. Okay, thank you for the question. And thank you, Professor, for your answer. So we actually have another question that it might be considered as related to the idea of Confucianism and why it is so entangled in Chinese society nowadays. And the question is, why do you think the personalities such as Mencius and Confucius are still so relevant that they still influence today's Chinese laws? Well, the answer to that is because Mencius and Confucius have just a special status uh, in Chinese society as uh, essentially well, one of my professors, when I learned Chinese history, used the term culture heroes. I mean, they're just sort of culture heroes uh, in Chinese culture. Uh, Confucianism uh, 
during the time of Confucius and Mencius, it's important to remember that Confucianism was just one philosophy among many. It was competing with other philosophies. Perhaps some of the participants have heard of Taoism, for example. Um, but in the Han Dynasty, essentially the government uh, in the Han Dynasty basically said, you know, for ruling China and for the official education system, we are not going to use any other philosophy other than Confucianism. And so from that point, Confucianism in Chinese history becomes the orthodox philosophy, and that carries through all of Chinese history, of course. Even uh, after the end of the Qing dynasty, the last uh, emperor, uh, the last uh, di uh, traditional Chinese dynasty uh, overthrown in 1911, and then the Republic of China starts, and then, of course, 1949, the PRC is founded. Obviously, Confucianism then has a special status because it was the orthodox philosophy in traditional um, uh, China. And Confucius, of course, is very special because he's considered the founder of Confucianism. Mencius also considered very special because he's considered by many to be the second most important Confucian, because after Confucius dies, um, Mencius, for lack of a better word, takes over and he defends Confucianism. So those two people have basically special status in Chinese culture, and that's why um, they still influence Chinese society today. I mean, every school child uh, in China mm, will read Confucius and Mencius in class um, uh, and uh, be expected to know them. It's not just mainland China, mainland China, Taiwan. Mm, uh, I'm not sure about um, Hong Kong, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Hong Kong required that as well. Do you, do you mind if I just add one little tidbit there? Of course, go ahead. I think for our, our audience participants who are maybe more familiar with the West, you could make the analogy to like Socrates and Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very ancient figures, similar idea where they, they have this sort of pupil apprentice kind of scholar position to each other even. And still to this day, you will find their thinking, their influence referenced in modern times, right? You will find American politicians who will brag about American democracy as going back to the ancient Greeks, to Socrates and Aristotle, right? In U.S. law school today, we still talk about using the Socratic method, meaning the method of learning that goes back to Socrates. And so I think these two figures in Chinese tradition hold a, a maybe a similar role, a similar sort of cultural heroism heroism mm -hmm. um you know to figures that we are more familiar with in the west that's right perfect thank you to both professor Fuma and Cole for their answers we still have time for a couple of questions more so we have another one which is how does this philosophical approach apply to the families of career criminals for example gang members or fraudsters Okay. Um, so, uh, well, uh, I'm not going to attempt to answer this question uh, from modern Chinese criminal law. That that would be a question we uh, at STL we would ask our modern Chinese criminal law expert how uh, career criminals are treated uh, in traditional China. However, in the Tang Dynasty, if uh, your relative, for example, your father or your uncle, was a career criminal or a fraudster, technically speaking, as long as he didn't commit one of the crimes which are listed in the exceptions. And I, I had provided some of them on the slide, like treason, plotting treason or plotting sedition. Even a career criminal, you could protect. Um, you could conceal his crime. You could help him escape. And uh, you... Uh, would not get punished. So if your uncle was a career criminal or a gang leader who was constantly committing crimes, as long as he wasn't committing one of those crimes that li are listed in the exceptions, like tr plotting treason, he, you could enjoy the mutual concealment uh, privilege as well uh, for those. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you, Professor. So we have another question here, um, and maybe who can help us with that one. And the question is, how can I apply to Peking University, and what are the documents you need to provide, and uh, what about the intake deadlines? Cole, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I can I can take that one quick. Although the the best answer is follow up with me directly, maybe after this lecture, and I can talk with any of you in in more depth. But but just to give you kind of a quick snapshot, um, our our application period or our admission cycle uh, is actually running currently. It just opened a couple months ago. And the intake period will go through March. Um, our basic application requirements are, are, I think, what you would sort of expect to see at most international programs around the world. You need some law background. You need your undergraduate degree um, and English proficiency. And then the documents are, you know, you fill out an application form, you know, you submit your degree, your transcripts showing the, the classes you've taken, the grades you've got, um, you know, a short essay about why you want to attend our program, um, some letters of recommendation, and, and that's, you know, that's about it. Again, my, my main recommendation is talk to me. I'm happy to tell you, you know, much more about the program and, uh, you know, how to best apply to it for anyone who's interested. Perfect. Thank you, Cole. So another question we um, we have for, from actually uh, a couple of participants is if they can get the slides after. So I don't know if Professor who wants to share those slides. But anyways, I want to tell everyone that at the end of the presentation, since you registered for this webinar, you will receive an email with all of the important contacts to get in touch with Peking University and also a link to the recording of the session. So in case you want to watch again the, the lesson, you can do so by clicking on the link that you will receive by email. Okay. So Uh, you became muted, Ooh. Alessandra. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this time it was my fault. So um, as I was saying, unfortunately, we have run out of time, uh, but we still have a couple of questions left. Again, if you do want to ask direct questions, uh, you can get in touch with Cole. And um, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us and especially thank again our panelists for being with us today. Thank you, Professor Ho, and thank you, Cole, for your thorough presentation and all of the answers you've given to the participants. And uh, I uh, hope to see you again at the next webinar organized by Doc City in partnership with Peking University. So bye, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>